Thank you. Now we have uh, Mr. Sutherland, also dealing with the Joshua issues. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would just quickly thank Margarita for the invitation. And uh, it's a pleasure here to be among some familiar faces in, in, in this group. I'm going to look a little differently from the other presentations. I'm going to look at the now situation and just to give you an idea how weather observing and forecasting is done in the, uh, around the world and then I will look at some of our uh, special things that we do inside the, the Caribbean region. Just by a quick definition, the uh, meteorology is really the study of the, the variables that make, give us our weather and uh, primarily it is the weather that occurs in that very, very low layer of the atmosphere called the troposphere. Just down in the bottom, the atmosphere all above us is not where our weather occurs, it's just in this bottom part in the troposphere, uh, which goes uh, and is about roughly 10 kilometers um, in height. So everything we look at and we experience really occurs just on the bottom. And I'm going to look at how we go about that because to understand the weather, we really need to observe all those elements in the whole world. We cannot just look at our weather outside our window or just around the Caribbean and expect to know what the weather is going to be like. Uh, I like to use the comparison to medicine. If you go to a doctor and he takes your temperature and sticks a thermometer under your tongue and you expect him to find out everything that's about going on in your body, you're wrong. The more he takes, the more he knows. And the same thing in meteorology, the, the difference is that the body that we are con concerned with is the whole earth. And we need to observe all the elements all around the world for us to be able to do uh, what, what we do. So as you see in red there, no political boundaries. During the Cold War, the Soviets and the Americans exchanged data. Iran and the United States exchanged data today. It doesn't matter what happens, the Cubans and the Americans. We have no political boundaries in, 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 in meteorology, and, and, and that you'll see later why, we, why that is important. So there is an international exchange that goes on, and then I will show a little later on how we have to use large computers to generate what we do before we come to the final product. And it's done in this way. A large global observing system under the auspices of the World Meteorological Organization, all these elements that you see, Stations on land, on sea, in the air, in space, all make up this large global observance system. Um, on the surface, most of these, of course, are in, uh, made by humans. We have 11,000 roughly land stations making hourly observations around the clock, never ends. Uh, so, any of you who have friends who are meteorologists know that they're shift workers. <laughs> um, take a look at Africa, you can see that there is a, a deficiency there in, in, in Africa in terms of land stations and that really is a uh, reflection of the economic situation in a number of African countries where the, the largest number of least developing countries exist and you can see the difference with Europe which is a cluttered, cluster. Upper level observations um, over land, and then, then like this, we have these free floating balloons going up to about uh, 100,000 feet. Twice a day, we make these observations, and these are actual observations taken from the land. Right here, Piaco, this is one of them, down here as well. We have to augment those 
with uh, specially equipped aircraft, commercial aircraft. Um, again, you can see where the heaviest commercial traffic is in North America and across into Europe. Um, and this complements these affair stations. This, this I, we can pick up any time to see where we are. And this is just a, a later version of saying the same thing. You can see a heavy cluster of, of the commercial traffic. But they do take automated state, um, observations, which we need. On the ocean, we have about 4,000 voluntary, voluntary merchant ships that make weather observations that deploy the routes. And we have a lot of more than drifting boys floating around the ocean, looking like these. And the one on the left, you can see the instruments on it. The drifting boys on the right are uh, uh, more concealed. And in 2004, which is what we, uh, our picture looked like, but we are always increasing them. And this is the number of these drifting and, and floating boys, um, more boys that we have around the world. I can check at any time. This was done two days ago. I, I just pulled that out to see what we had. Um, and, and if you keep this picture in mind, and later on you'll, you'll, I'll, I'm going to make a uh, reference to, to, to the oceans again. Lots of weather satellites, and we're always increasing them. 2004, we had the number you see there, five uh, polar orbiting and six geostationary. And uh, this is the status right now. Uh, we've increased the number of, of satellites around. Um, the polar orbiting are the ones that fly close to the Earth, 850 kilometers in the in the in, in these orbits um, via close to the pole, over the pole, and the geostationary ones, which uh, uh, are 35,000 kilometers high. That's the only way we can get them to stay over one position. Um, on, 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 on relative to the Earth. So the geostationary satellites are what we use for the image on the right to, so we can study one particular area. Same as, as we use for telecommunications, the geostationary satellites. <coughs> In our region, uh, I'm just going to look at some of the special things that we have. We use a global set as our basic tool, but then we we run some very high resolution imagery on the areas of our interest, and this is the Eastern Atlantic. We constantly monitor um, right over our Caribbean area. Uh, this is the moisture field over the, over the region, so even though they may not be clouds, they might be the moisture field is there, and we need to monitor that part of it. And this is a routine uh, monitoring of, uh, in a loop form of visible imagery and uh, across our region. In any other service, you will see this constantly being monitored um, and, uh, and interpreted as we go along. Uh, and I'm going to, if you see this little band here, it will bear it in mind as we will talk a little later on about what happened in the Christmas Day storm um, in, in the islands. Sometimes we monitor several major systems, and here we have three hurricanes at one time, and one in the Gulf of Mexico here. This was back in, in 2010. And sometimes we, well, this is the sort of message that we send out to the public, let them know what's uh, being monitored at, at any one time. We have some uh, more boys to the east of the island chain. These are run by the French. And the United States has a set of uh, boys in the Caribbean Sea and also east of the island chain. Um, these are our regional data sets that we, we uh, complement a lot of the, the global set with. One of our more recent um, things we've been toying is with lightning detection. And this is not yet a fully operational tool, um, but we are looking at that. And many of you may have heard in the region we use hurricane hunters. This jet stream is for high levels. When we, there's a hurricane that threatens land, we fly this in the outskirts of the hurricane to, to pick more data. And the, this one, this, this Lockheed P-3, and this U.S. Air Force Reserve, 
fly the low levels and penetrate the eye. In the, the image on the right, you can see it's actually inside uh, the hurricane eye, where you see the clear skies, and yet you can see the eye wall. Uh, and they fly in this particular pattern, and these are the instruments dropped, uh, drop sounds uh, from the aircraft inside the hurricane to get more data. This is our newest tool. This is the weather radar in the central mountains at Tabat Keith here in Trinidad. And um, one of your sponsors, um, Able Engineering, are the ones who built this for us. Um, and uh, we, this, this is an image from the Trinidad radar. Oh, um, the, um, and just a, a, a day of just some scattered showers across Trinidad, and we can run these as loops all the time. In Barbados, this is their radar. You can see the coverage from Trinidad up to close to part of Guadeloupe at any one time. This was Hurricane Thomas in 2010 on the Barbados radar. And sometimes we run them as loops. This is with our colleagues in the French Islands. This is uh, the same Hurricane Thomas come across in the islands um, uh, in 2010. This is taken from a composite of Martinique and Gordo Bregas. And this is Hurricane Richard in 2010 also, going slamming right into Belize. Tony, Tony Gibbs talk about the storm surge issue there in, 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 in Belize City. And this really demonstrated because Richard did the same thing there. And, and brought the storm surge, which is really the water captured inside the eye because of the very low pressure that comes ashore with the eye and creates so much damage. Sometimes we look, because our radars are Doppler radars, we look at other things on it. This is a Guyana, our Guyana radar, and the, the Doppler features allow us to get an estimate of the wind structure. And also, this area here we were particularly concerned about, we wanted to see the structure of that, so we also have the ability to do a, a cross-section across any part of the, the system to see what it looks like in the vertical. <coughs> this is the Jamaica radar, and this is our new network with the new kid on the block, the Cayman Islands, which we put in last year. Philips Engineering was our engineering consultants. So what happens with all this data? We run these things through, we exchange them around the world in a massive global telecommunication system with the World Meteorological Organization. And then we have to put them in map forms to assemble what's going on around the world. This is in the upper levels. And study all the satellite imagery, the surface, the sea temperatures, and the anomalies. And then we stick them into some mathematical equations. This is where the forecasting comes about. It is very difficult for the whole Earth. We have to put them in. I only show this not to, to describe the equations, but to show you that the equations are related to time and space. So since there's a time element, we can project them forward in time, all these equations. And then the results, we put them back into a map form. So from the, the, from the global the observing, we go into a bunch of computers that produce our forecast at a number of centers around the world which shares it to everyone. And your local forecasters then make their local forecast from it. This is an example of what the computer output would look like before it's modified by your local forecasters. And then this is an example of how they'll modify it to produce a forecast of what the, all these equations will give them. And on that basis, the forecasters will then uh, determine what's likely to happen. And these are all forecasts of the high seas and so on. So that, just quickly, in our hurricane region, here in, in, in the Caribbean, we, you heard mention about the hurricane center in Miami. We have, by agreement, they're responsible for giving guidance into these areas but all our forecasts and warnings are actually done at the national level, not by Miami, they only provide guidance. And, and this, this is the area that are responsible that we have set <coughs> for the islands. I just block that up to show you that and if, if, we, if our data in the Caribbean is missing, we're just as important as any country 
because 71% of the world is actually ocean and every bit of every country's data is as critical as big and small uh, and irrespective of your political agenda. So that's it uh, from the global observance through the numerical models down to the national level and then they produce their forecast. Thank you very much.